context. We have two systems in South Africa. Anybody who's heard Nick Spoll or people from Recep talk will tell you that there are two systems in South Africa. We have 5,000 schools, about 20% of the overall system, that are world-class and they do very well and they get 100% pass rate in matric or ish, you know, 98% pass rate. And, and they have a, you know, a reasonably easy job. And then we have 80% of our schools, that this is 20,000 schools, that are not getting, giving us those same outcomes. And it's very easy for us to start to become judgmental. And I hear that people say to people, well, you know, if part-time girls, hi, can have high levels of results, why can't you? But they don't take into account the context, the environment, the challenges that are faced in those schools. And that's one of the things that drive me personally, is this, this unbelievable inequality in the system. And how that inequality is, is kind of permeating the whole system in so many different ways. But there's a very particular aspect to this inequality, and it has to do with a few things. Firstly, uh, the school principals. That many of the principals in these well-resourced, well-functioning schools have had a, 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 very, a very different um, career path to become a principal to most principals who are in under-resourced schools. So we have to acknowledge that there's a lot of work that we can do, all of us um, collectively, to provide more support to school principals. Do, are we in agreement that that's an important part? But we're going to talk today about another aspect. So I'm, I often use part-time bills high just because it's kind of an easier, it's an, it's an easy target for me. The principle at Parktown Girls High is surrounded by people who bring knowledge and skills and resources to that school. <coughs> when the principal at Parktown Girls High wants to do a, her budget, she doesn't do it herself because she has five people on the, I'm making this up, she has lots of people on the accounting committee and there's probably two qualified CAs plus a few accountants. And there are a whole bunch of people on the HR committee, and there are a whole bunch of people on the, on the sports committee, and the grounds, and the infrastructure, and whatever. Now, when you go to Lindalani school, and say to Lindalani, so Lindalani, where are, where's your HR committee? He goes, where's your finance committee? Where's your everything? It all comes on to Lindalani's shoulders. And I think that's blatantly unfair. Do you agree with me? Yes. And, it's, and that's where the inequality of our country comes from. So my dream, and it is the thing that drives me every single day, is to say, how do we share some of these resources with these lonely educators and principals who have so much on their shoulders? And how do we find ways of redistributing the support systems that are available to these 5,000 well resourced schools that make them more available? And how do we get everybody in our mutual? Oh, I saw our mutual here earlier. How do we get everybody in our mutual to know that they have knowledge and skills and resources to share? And there are people with HR and IT and finance skills in our mutual that if we could somehow tap into that and invite them into our communities, they can bring some of those <coughs> skills and liberty and F and B and first round. And, and so this is part this is the work that we're doing. The work of how do we mobilize more support? to the principals who need it most. Because at the moment, the principals who have get more, and the principals who don't have get nothing. It's just not fair. So, <laughs> and, and then there's another piece. Because I feel, now I'm going to be hard on the principals, you have to forgive me for this. I remember when I started this work 10 years or 7 years ago, this is the conversation that kept us going. Our children are awake 5,800 a year, more, uh, hours a year, more or less. This is if they sleep at kind of eight and a half hours every night. Then on average, they're awake about 5,800 hours a year. Of that time, they spend 1,200 hours at school. That's 20% of their awake hours. The rest of the time, they spend in the community. And yet somehow, We've kind of made up the story that says it's the educator's responsibility to, to raise the children 
and we've forgotten that it's the community's responsibility to raise the children. <coughs> and, and we've been letting parents off the hook. So parents drop the kids off in grade one, and they pick the kids up in grade 12, and then they complain that they can't, you know, that they don't get good results. And, and educators have kind of let that happen. So, so, so when Ridwan and I, Ridwan somebody and I, started our journey of Partners for Possibility, Ridwan had a story about parents in Kanamaya Primary. Now, I want to check whether anybody else in this room has a story that Ridwan had six years ago. And the story was, parents in our community are not interested. <coughs> and he said to me, typical white woman stuff, the story about parental engagement. In our community, parents aren't interested. Parents are interested in the rich, wealthy, white suburbs. Does anybody else have a story that says parents aren't interested? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Let me <coughs> So I read one like that, and it was a very firmly held belief that says parents are not interested, and it's just how it is, and don't you come with all your white women stuck into our school. So I come from a world that says when people have a story, whatever the story is, if the story is, I don't know, whatever. So in this case, this story. But our parents are not interested. If they have a story, it's worth holding the story up to the light, kind of looking at the story and say, is this story useful? Is this story going to get us where we need to be? Now, in Kanamaya Primary, Ridwan and I had a vision. We started this and then it, become the, it became the community's vision that we wanted the school to become the school of choice in Grassley Park, which is in the Western Cape. Um, and so I held up the story. I said, we're going to on this story. Is this story going to help us to become the school of choice in Grassley Park? We said, no, but it's, it's true and we can't do anything about it. <coughs> so, so I don't buy that. So, so we started on a journey, everybody and I, to say, well, is that true and will it help us? And so we decided that we're going to create an alternative experience. And we invited, and we did a whole sorts of interesting things, I'll tell you about it later if you want to. But we got 80 parents into a room one evening, grade four parents. We used the children, the children made a card, the children, we, we bribed the children, we said if you bring your parent then you can have service tomorrow and you don't have to pay. We, I mean we did everything, but we got 80 parents in a room one evening. And this was, this was the two great Great um, four classes, and some kids didn't bring any parent, and some kids brought two, but there were 80 children and 80 parents. And the, the, the educators had eyes this big because they thought that the parents aren't interested, and here the parents are, and they're all interested. And then the whole evening we, we asked questions, and the parents showed how interested they were. And at the end of the evening, I said, Redwan, you know that story that says the parents aren't interested? Do you think that's true? He says, well, that's going to be hard for me to now tell that story. I have, a, I have to tell a new story. So we started a new story. And the new story was at Kanamea Primary, the parents are partners to the teachers. And every time we gathered, we told a story about a parent who showed up at the school. And very soon, that became the new story. It became the way that things are now at Kanama Primary. Parents do 50% of the work, teachers do 50% of the work, and we've got a whole way of that. But we don't have Ridwan here today. So I, I can tell Ridwan's story, but that's not good enough. So what we did today is we brought, uh, we asked Fakili and Lenilani to tell something about their story of inviting the community as a resource to the school and to bring the kind of support that we need um, into that school. So we're going we're gonna to kind of listen to Lindelani as a starting point, and then there's going to be some time for you ask, to ask questions. We have time today. And then we're going to listen to Fakile, and we're going to hear some, some, get some feedback from her, or we're going to create an opportunity for questions. And we have today, we're, very, we're delighted we have someone from the SABPP, the South African Board of People Practitioners, because one of the people who can contribute to our schools is HR people. We were going to have someone from SICA, to talk about um, the role that accountants can play, unfortunately, could not be here. But, but we're going to get an idea just from the SABDP. And so, but the idea really is that we create opportunity for questions. So, does anybody have a question before we start with um, listening to Linda Baum? Yes. Are you going to put your video on to um, YouTube? YouTube. It always goes on to YouTube. 
Thank you. So all the videos are on YouTube. So this is just uh, another example. So have you guys <coughs> have been aware, are you aware of all the things that happened in Lavender Hill recently? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of our principals, Gavin Alcana, works for a school called Hillwood Primary. And Gavin, uh, and, and there was a lot of gang fear in the on the fans, specifically in Lavender Hill in the last few weeks. But because that, um, Gavin is part of responsibility, uh, Gavin started, when, when the gang phase started and the, and the shooting started around the school, he reached out to his part of responsibility community uh, leadership circle. And he sent us all a video, or a little clip. He says, this is the sound of the gun fair outside of my school. But what I was so inspired by is how the community responded. And so, well, I was so upset about it one evening that I, that I decided, you know what, it's not fair that Gavin has to sit here and struggle all by himself with gang fear around the school, and no one else is doing something. So I tweeted, I said, we need advice because we have all this gang violence and no one's doing something about it. And that get, got picked up by the media, <coughs> it got picked up by Helen Zilla, and we then got um, Fakile Mabula um, to, to kind of start to take it up. So there is a lot of Tweety. For, for those of you who are not on Twitter, you're really missing out. This is a good fun stuff. And then, then we started to get, um, we started to identify individual people who could potentially contribute to that. Um, and Peter Herring is one of the photographers. He picked up the story. And then uh, Tembi or Dorcas picked up the story. And then the next thing we knew is Jonathan Janssen picked up the story. And in last week's Times, uh, his article in the Times that he writes every week, he writes the story about Gavin Alcana. But let me quickly read to you what he says, which is so beautiful. He says, Gavin Alcana is the kind of principal who restores my faith in the power of leadership to change the fate of the poorest child. Since he became principal of Hillwood Primary School in Lavender Hill, things started to change. And then he tells about how it changed. He says, of course it makes no sense to expect anything approximately, approximating education to happen under such conditions of duress. He's talking about the gang fair on the cat flats. No child can, co can concentrate and no teacher can offer the emotional calm and deliberation required for e efficacious, e efficacious sorry, teaching. And no principal can secure a school in the face of armed thug. And then he says, and what we need is the coordinated response of national, provincial, and local resources to attend to the crisis. The fact of the matter is, Gavin on his own could not mobilize that. But we as a community could, and we did. And a few days after this was published, the Premier of the Western Cape met with Gavin and his team. She made three million rands available to the school, to the community, to deal with, to, to bring in some safety measures. And they did everything that we asked for at that school because there was this larger voice and not just Gavin on his own. 